Some of you I know, and it's good to see you again. Some of you I don't know, but there's a third category. There's some people I know, and I can't remember your names. <laughs> this uh, comes to all of us. If you haven't experienced that yet, don't worry, it's coming. Um, <clears throat> so a welcome to all of you this morning as we come together to worship the Lord. My name, well let me just, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> explain what you're, what you've come to, the English Church in Metadorm, Evangelical International, non-denominational, and we want all of you, how many are here for the first time? <laughs> right, okay. We want you to be very welcome and to be part of the family here. Okay. Where are you from? Midlands. The Midlands, okay. Anybody from further away than the British Isles? Belgium. Belgium. Okay, that's actually closer, but never mind. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, it's great. I remember last year, my. Sorry. Um, let, me, let, me, let me do things in the right order. Because Trevor, who's the pastor here, who's not here this weekend, has set this up for me. And uh, I'm, I'm a novice. I'm learning these things, okay? So we're learning together. In the service later on, as we sing one of the songs, we'll have an opportunity to give to the work of God in Benidorm here. If you brought something and you can give, that's fine. If you haven't, uh, you can give online at uh, www.englishchurchbenedorm.com. And after the service this morning, we'll have uh, some tea and coffee uh, that will be provided in our uh, community area. This week, this coming week, there will be uh, the normal uh, times of coming together. Wednesday at 11 o'clock. It's easy, you just have to remember 11 o'clock. Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay? So that's easy. Um, on a Wednesday, Bible study and prayer at 11 o'clock. And then Friday at 11 o'clock, there's a communion service. And <clears throat> there's something uh, big coming up at the end of the month. From Monday the 26th to Friday the 30th of June, grow and go. And um, that's something that I hope all of you who are here not just on holiday, but here longer term, will be involved with. It's growing, so in the mornings you've got opportunities to meet together, to look at, I think it's the life of the book of Jonah, and then there will be seminars to help to encourage in your discipleship, and then uh, there will be craft opportunities as well, for those of you who are crafty, and, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and the afternoon is free. And then the evenings, there's an opportunity to pray and to go and witness. This just repeats that. The Bible teaching the book of Jonah, practical how-to sessions in Christian discipleship. And um, the challenge in the evenings is to go out onto the strip and to talk to people about your faith. It says here, personal evangelism. That's a scary thing. That scares people. But actually... It's just talking about your story and finding out, out the story of other people and sharing and saying, can I share my story with you? And last year when we were here, we went out a few times uh, and did that on the strip. And you get some very interesting conversations. You get some quite long conversations. You get probably quite a few very short conversations like, no thanks. I'm here on holiday. I don't want to be bothered with that stuff, whatever. But it's good for us to be encouraged to do that. And um, this is me, Ivor Greer. I'm from a town called Bawtree, which is right in the center of England. If you were to draw, to draw an X across um, the, the, the map, the, the lines would cross in Bawtree, I reckon. So one of the things we love about coming to Spain is that we see the sea because we're so far from the sea where we live. And um, this, uh, today, uh, I've known Trevor and Sheila for, or Trevor and Maggie. Now there's a Freudian slip. 
We knew Trevor and his first wife, Sheila, for many, many years and know the family very well. We were members of the same church. We used to encourage them when they were working in uh, the south of Ireland as uh, missionary pastors there. And uh, we've got to know Maggie since uh, Trevor has uh, been married to Maggie. So we know Trevor and Maggie uh, quite well as well. And um, we are here to relieve them and allow them to go back to the family wedding this weekend. And uh, I think they've had a good time there. Today we're going to look at Psalm 132. And we're going to sing God's praises together. Before we do that, um, let me do, and the words will be on the screen for you as well. Um, <clears throat> so before we do that, let's read uh, a little bit of Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in a Epaphra. We find it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay, that's great. Um, those words are words that we'll be focusing on a little bit later on. There are, uh, on your chairs, there are Bibles um, from which that, uh, the version that that was taken from, and there are also copies of Mission Praise. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing as our first song, number 200. And let me just say, when it talks there about the slumber of your eyes, these guys have a two-hour sleep. <laughs> So let's pray that their eyes will remain open <laughs> for the next hour. Thank you for uh, being prepared to come and, and lead us in our worship today. It's great uh, to have them with us. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for what you've done in our lives. I thank you that we have a story to tell. I thank you that you've given us your word to guide and lead and direct us. And I pray that as we sing these songs to you, as we hear the readings, and as we follow you in these days, and, and hear what you want to say to us this morning, that you will bless us. Bless Trevor and Maggie, wherever they are today, and bless others who might normally meet with us, uh, but are away for whatever reason. Father, just guide and lead us in this service this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's stand and we'll sing. Number 200, if you need the books, the words will be on the screen.
voice this morning. <clears throat> Please be seated. And uh, I just want to pick up some of the words as we pray for ourselves and our situation from that third verse. Pardon for sin. I wonder whether we undervalue that sometimes. Pardon for sin and the peace that endures. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in confidence because of Jesus. We can come to you in confidence because Jesus died at Calvary to bear the punishment for my sin, past, present, and future. And Father, I thank you that you can give each one of us here who has come to the foot of the cross that peace that endures. Father, this uh, congregation of your people, I don't know the details in each person's heart and life, but I know that there'll be those facing challenges today. And I pray that each one of us will know your strength for today. Some people will have fears for the future. They'll have concerns for what, what's going to happen. And Father, I pray that you'll give each one of us that bright hope for tomorrow. Father, I pray that as we uh, continue to sing to you and to allow you to minister to each of our hearts that we will sense your own dear presence to cheer us and to guide us on our way. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a, a song of, of praise to God, number four, uh, sorry, 242 in our books. And uh, the words will be on the screen as well. Two or two.
Freddie mentioned that uh, this church uh, appreciates those who will support uh, the work here. Um, I'm not quite sure if this has been left for me on purpose, but there it is in the in the pulpit here uh, an opportunity, an invitation to be one of 50 church partners, a commitment. And if you're uh, interested in that, if you haven't got one of these, then uh, please ask me for one uh, at the end. It's four things that you commit to do, to pray regularly for this church, to tell others about this church so that they can attend when they're on holiday here, uh, to commit to giving 10 pounds a month to the church to do it online, and to visit the church when you can. Now, uh, Kenny and Wendy, I was talking to them earlier, and they said they used to be frequent and regular visitors here uh, until COVID. And this week is your first week back in Benidorm since then. So let's hope that they will be regular attenders and will tell others about the church. We're going to, as we sing our next uh, song, which is Blessed Be the Name, number four, uh, 809, we're going to have an opportunity to take up our offering. Don't worry if you haven't come prepared. That's okay. Uh, just allow the, um, the container to pass you by. And Oscar is going to come and uh, take up the offering for us. So please be, uh, remain seated as we start to sing this and uh, um, Eva is going, to, is going to come and take up the offering.
Thank you. So one more song that we will sing in a moment. Let me just pray and give thanks to God for our giving. Father, we thank you that we are privileged, that we ha you have provided for our needs. And from what you provided to us, we can give towards the work of God in this place. Father, I pray for those who will uh, determine how these how the resources are spent. And I pray that many in this time of Benador will come to know Jesus because of the work and witness of his church. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to <clears throat> remind ourselves of these blessings that we have from Jesus. Uh, number 787, which is yesterday, today, and forever. Because we worship a God who doesn't change. We change. We have uh, situations that come to us and sometimes throw us off guard. But we worship a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So stand to sing 787, and uh, the words are on the screen. So the passion in verses 1 to 5, the plan in verses 6 to 10, and the promises in verses 11 to 18. And I want to concentrate primarily on the passion, because it's something that in these recent days God has been showing me, uh, talking to me about my passion. What is my passion for Jesus. Do I have a love affair with Jesus? And um, as we look at the opening verses of this psalm, let's remind ourselves um, of that passion. And I want to, to think not only of David's passion, because this is a psalm it's not by David, but it talks about David. It's one of the songs of ascent that the children of Israel sang as they went up to Jerusalem each year. 
and they would have sung that just as we have been singing and uh, they would have have shared with each other uh, about that uh, journey that they were on physical journey but also as with many of us uh, an emotional journey uh, a spiritual journey a way in which we can get closer to God and the opening verses of this is uh, what, what I want to concentrate on as we look at David's passion David's passion Psalm 132 uh, the first uh, five verses Lord remember David and all his self denial he swore an oath to the Lord he made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob I will not enter my house or go to my bed I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob I don't know how much you know about the story of uh, David but in some of the highlights of that story self-denial is not the first thing that springs to mind for me we know the story so well don't we of where he should have been out doing things but he was relaxing and here in Benidorm you can you can think of that relaxing beside the pool or relaxing on the uh, roof of his palace and he saw this beautiful lady Bathsheba and it's not the time now to go into that story but he succumbed he did not have that self-denial but as we uh, see the the subsequent verses there he says I'll not enter my house or go to my bed or allow my sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord a dwelling of the mighty one of Jacob this is the only psalm that mentions the Ark of the Covenant again if you know your Old Testament scriptures you'll know that the children of Israel were on a journey and on that journey they carried the Ark of the Covenant the visible presence of God with them and here they were in, in Jerusalem and we'll see as the uh, story unfolds how David recognized that he needed to do something to give a permanent home to this Ark of the Covenant and to, to create the temple but as I thought about David and his passion for God that comes out in these first uh, few verses I thought of another passage uh, another psalm that he wrote and if you happen to have your Bibles you might want to turn to Psalm 27 and Psalm 27 a great psalm for David and uh, <clears throat> Carol and I have just been on a, on a retreat this last week near Alicante and we've been looking at Psalm 23 the shepherd psalm the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want but each day that we were on that retreat God brought to our attention these words that are on the screen one thing I ask for the Lord ask from the Lord this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple and we actually sang a song each morning as we reflected on those words to gaze on the beauty of the Lord I want, I want you to pause in your own thoughts and minds at the moment and think when was the last time you did that when did you have that encounter with Jesus 
but caused you to gaze on his face, to seek him in his temple. It's a testimony perhaps to where you are with, with the Lord that you're, you're here today uh, because you want to meet with God's people in this place. Before we, we uh, sing uh, a chorus that reminds me of that, I just want to look at the passion of another character in Scripture for the Lord Jesus. And that's Paul's passion. In Philippians uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, he says this, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you see the passion there? Do you see what he's saying? I press on. I press on, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what lies ahead. I, according to my family, rather stupidly, have um, <coughs> uh, entered a half marathon race in September. And I decided a few weeks ago that I had to do some training for that. And so yesterday morning, I went out for a run along the, uh, uh, the beach here. Tried to do 5K, didn't quite make it, but uh, and didn't quite keep going the whole time. It was very early in the morning, it wasn't early enough because it was still getting warm. But those words there were said, Paul says, Forgetting what lies behind, straining towards what is ahead, reminds me of those times when I go running. I do 5K on a Saturday morning, a thing called a park run uh, that happens all over the world, but not in Spain. Uh, for apparently, I don't know why, but not in Spain. Anyway, uh, as I get to the end of that 5K, I see the end in sight. And I might have been walking, I might have been jogging, I might have been going very slowly, but that helps me to speed up. And that, that's what Paul is saying here, straining towards what, what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for what Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see something of David's passion. He wanted to gaze on God's face. We see something of Paul's passion straining towards that prize. What about us? What about us? <coughs> you may know this chorus. We're just going to sing the chorus. There's a, there's a whole uh, number of verses that I will uh, read to you. But the chorus of this little song that can ring in your head for the rest of today. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can we sing it? where justice and mercy embrace, where the Son of God gave his life for us and our measureless debt was erased. Turn your eyes to the morning. Some of us love the mornings 
and see Christ the lion awake. What a glorious dawn. Fear of death is gone. For we carry his life in our hands. And finally, turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will shout. All glory to Jesus alone. Where's our passion? Where's your passion? Where's my passion? For Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what he says. That's what he wants to do. But in the next part of Psalm 132, uh, I'm sorry I don't have it on the screen, but let me read it to you from verse 6 uh, to verse 10. We heard it in a patra. We came upon it in the fields of jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness, and your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. See, David knew that he needed to do something about this ark. It was left, and you can read the story in 1 Samuel, uh, where the ark was in a remote place. And it was being tended by those who were there. But David recognized that he needed to do something about this. Verse 7, let us go to his dwelling place, that is the ark, let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. So David's passion resulted in a plan that he had. He wanted to uh, do something about this. And we read about it, and there are some verses here that I'll uh, read to you. It just gives you the background to this from 2 Samuel uh, verses, uh, well, some verses from, from uh, 2 Samuel 7, from verse 1 to verse 13. And let me read it. The words will be on the screen. When King David was settled in his palace, the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies. The king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I'm living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. David's passion, he wanted to do something about the ark. He wanted to uh, put the contents of the ark into a proper building, not just the tent. And then we go on uh, to verse 4 in that same chapter. But that same night, the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? 
I've never lived in a house. From the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day, I've always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. So God reminded Nathan overnight that uh, he didn't need a temple. He didn't ask David to do this. And then we go to the next part of the story, uh, verse 7. Yet no matter where I've gone with the Israelites, I've never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I've never once asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? And God speaking to Nathan says this, Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be a leader of my people. I've been with you wherever you've gone and I've destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on earth. Jumping to verse 12. For when you die, you are buried with your ancestors. But I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. A story that relates to Psalm 132, but is, is a bit different. I want just to share with you the plan, because in this reading that I've just read to you, we see three plans. We see David's plan. We see Nathan's plan, if you like, as God gave it to him. And we see God's plan, David's plan. <clears throat> Second Samuel uh, num uh, 7, verse 2. David said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of, the God, of God remains in a tent. He was disquieted by this. He felt that he should uh, do something about it. But you know, Nathan's initial response was, verse 3, he replied to King, Do what, uh, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do, for the Lord is with you. I want to ask each one of us, myself included, do we have a plan? Do we have a, a, something that we believe we should do? And it's a good plan. Go ahead and do it, Nathan says, for the Lord is with you. But maybe it's not God's plan for you. And David had to listen the next morning to what Nathan said. And Nathan was a, was a prophet, was a man of God. But sometimes we want to press on with our own ideas. And God says, no, it's not what I'm asking. And so God's plan in that passage that I read, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. And he is the one who will build a house for my end. Nothing wrong with the plan, nothing wrong with the idea. Nathan said, it's whatever you have in mind, the Lord is with you. Nathan had to listen to what God said. And he had to reflect on it. And in that reading that uh, I read to you from that passage, you'll see that God said, I've never needed a house built in Cedar. I've been with you. From God's perspective, it was more important to be with them takes us back to that passion again to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to see him forever.
And so the question for me, and the question for all of us is, what is the plan that we're following? Are we prepared to listen and to seek God's face? We can do it through his word. One of the things that is precious to each one of us is we have the Holy Spirit with us, guiding, leading, directing us. We can read his word. God will not ask us to do anything that is contrary to what is in his word. We can ask advice from godly people whom we respect. And David did this with Nathan. But sometimes they need to take stock as well. I have some very good friends and I have issues that I'm facing at the moment. And I've been sharing these things with these friends. What should I do? And none of them have said to me, you should do this, you should do that. I said, we'll pray with you. We'll pray that God will direct you. That you will do what God wants. And that's what we need in this situation. The passion. The passion. I, if you forget everything that I've said today, don't forget the passion. Don't forget straining towards that goal. Because you've got the Holy Spirit to help you with that. And finally, the promises. <clears throat> there are a number of promises in the latter part of this psalm. There's that forever home. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. That final verse of turn your eyes upon Jesus that I read to you that we didn't sing. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our king will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. Our forever home. And that's important for us to remember. But there's another blessing in verses 16 and 17 that says this. I will bless this city, blessings for the city, and make it prosperous. I will satisfy its poor with food. I will clothe its priests with godliness. Its faithful servants will sing for joy. And you know, as a body of people gather together in a particular physical location, I believe that God gives blessings to that city, that community where they are. We've seen it through the work of this church that's been established, I don't know how many years it's been going on, but the, the, the work of this church, reaching out to people in need, some will reject it, some will welcome it with open arms, but God's work will be done. There will be blessing for the city. We saw it, I didn't know until this morning when Oscar and, and his wife shared with me some photographs of that march for Jesus in Alicante yesterday. Wow. Blessings for the city. I will bless the city and make it prosperous. I will satisfy its poor with food. I know that in this church you have a program to, to take food to those who are in need. I will bless the city in this way. And then finally, one of the promises at the end of the psalm, in verse 18, sorry, verse 18. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head shall be adorned with a radiant crown. Paul touched on that, didn't he, when he said, in Philippians, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As you run the race, you don't run it for the prize. As I'm struggling with my 5K and I, I start to sprint towards the finish line, 
I, I, I'm just thinking, I want to get there, I want to get finished. But there is that prize. And there are a few places in Scripture, and we don't have time to go into them, but uh, a couple of Scripture verses that remind us of that radiant crown. And one is in James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Friends, there is a prize. There is the forever home. There, there are blessings for the city, but there is a crown. And in uh, Psalm 132, it talks about a radiant crown. There's another mention in Revelation at the end of uh, Scripture. And uh, let me read this to you. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Right through this service, from the very beginning, we've been thinking about fears that we might have. And some of those might be might take different forms. I'm conscious, I was talking to, uh, to, to Sharon earlier about those who were with us last year but are no longer with us. And you said, but they're in a better place. I think of Dorothy, who uh, we were privileged to meet Dorothy and Bob when we were here last Easter. Some of you will know me. And Dorothy's funeral has just happened a few weeks ago and you guys were able to attend. And we send our greetings to Bob in that loss that he has. We think of Christine, and Kenny reminded me of Christine who died and was so vibrant and so uh, part of the life of this church, and she's gone to be with the Lord. So do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. You will suffer persecution, that verse says, and then it says be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So for Dorothy and Christine, they have got life forevermore. So let's get that perspective right in our hearts, in the sunlight of Benidorm, in the heat of Benidorm. Let us have that perspective that in this psalm we're reminded of to have that passion to gaze into the face of Jesus. <clears throat> Remember that little chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of Benidorm will go strangely dim in the light of his beauty and grace. Let's remember the plan. I believe God has a plan for each one of us. And by his Holy Spirit at work within our hearts, he will guide us and lead us into what that plan should be. And let us remember the promises that there are in God's word. The promises that this psalm reminds us of, a forever home, blessing for the city, and a radiant crown. We're going to sing about some of those uh, promises that we have in Scripture as our final song, standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Let's sing this as we close, bring our service to a close.
promises, I cannot fail. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Father, we pray that this may be true in each of our lives today. Guide us by your Spirit. Help us to be so in love with Jesus as we gaze on his beautiful face that it will be reflected in what we do today. Those people that we meet, those people that you bring us into contact with who don't know you as Savior. Father, help us to reflect Jesus to, to them. In the name of our precious Savior we ask. Amen. Thank you. Coffee.